We are in the book of Titus, if you'd like to turn there in the New Testament. Another one of the pastoral epistles. I was asked to uh, share a story with you when I got the call that uh, Jesse was passing away. They'd contacted hospice and, and uh, through emails with the, the sons, they said, well, you know, we, we could have you come over, but he, he's kind of in a coma and uh, he, he's probably not going to be able to respond to you at all, but we'd love to have you come over and, and pray anyway. So I went over there, and they, and they said, yeah, he, he's in a coma. He's, he, he's all, but, all but gone. His, his hours are limited. And I said, he's in a coma, huh? Let's see. Got a hospital bed set up in the living room, so I sat on the edge of his bed and grabbed his hand and said, Jesse, how you doing? He opened his eyes, and he goes, Pastor Jim. <laughs> I said, you squeeze my hand if, you, if I, I'm good to pray with you. And he squeezed my hand, and, and we prayed. I just committed him into God's hands. He was going home. I was a bit jealous, you know. And I said, say hi to everybody up there for me, Jesse. We'll be not far behind you. And he slipped back into his coma. And the next morning he passed away. You know, we have to keep a loose grip on the loved ones in this life. You never know when God's going to take them home. And we, our job is to love them, make them the best loved, best fed sheep we possibly can as long as they're here. That's your job. Love people. If you don't get anything else right in life, get this one thing straight. The one command that Jesus left with his disciples. He said, a new commandment I give you guys. Love one another. If you don't get anything else right, in fact, you may not get anything else right if you just love one another. And you know what love looks like, 1 Corinthians 13? Love is patient. Love is kind. Keeps no record of wrongs. Not easily offended. Love covers a multitude of sins. You know that, that list well. Practice that. Because it's not what you say you believe. It's what you act out that shows the world what you really believe. And that's what I like about the book of Titus. Titus is a Latin name, which means he's a Roman convert uh, of, of Paul's. He's a Gentile, a non-Jewish convert. Uh, and he's not mentioned in the book of Acts on any of Paul's missionary trips. But he's mentioned 13 times in the rest of the New Testament. He worked with Paul at Ephesus during the great apostles, third missionary journey there. And from there, Paul was impressed enough to say, and said, you know, I got a problem church on down the road here from Ephesus. Would you go to Corinth and help them to get their ducks in a row? Now, if you haven't read the first epistle to the Corinthians lately, that church was a hot mess. I don't know that they got anything right. They, were, they had questions coming and going come out of a long and distinguished pagan background. They had some real issues. But apparently, Paul saw in Titus a capable enough young man. You've passed the small test with me here in Ephesus. I'm going to send you to Corinth. Corinth was the place where pastors went to die. It was a hard pagan society. But he had done well enough with the Corinthian church that Paul then said, you did such a bang-up job then, I'm going to send you to the island of Crete, one of the, the largest Greek island that's in the, the Mediterranean. Paul obviously had a great deal of confidence in this young man uh, to carry on the most difficult of ministry challenges. Now, Crete was not an insignificant island. Uh, Greece owns over 6,000 islands. This is the largest of them, about 3,200 square miles. It boasts some 8,000-foot mountain peaks and was once the proud center of the advanced Minoan civilization 2,500 years before Christ. Uh, the earliest known civilization in Europe all took place on that little island of, of Crete. Unfortunately, by New Testament times, the moral climate of the society there had sunk over time to such a deplorable level that their, their immorality had reached legendary proportions. In fact, uh, the, the conduct of its inhabitants was proverbial. We'll see that here in the opening uh, verses. They lived for one thing only. Sounds much like the world today. They lived for personal pleasure. 
As long as it felt good and they were free to do it, just don't ask anything else up. So that you can imagine in that endless pursuit of hedonism, personal pleasure, the result, according to uh, Paul, is gluttony, paganism, immorality, alcoholism. And what surprises me most of all is Paul says, cool, let's plant a church there. They got problems with alcohol and drugs and they're just a hot mess. Yeah, let's plant a church there. How opposite it is today where church planters are going, well, where's the most affluent neighborhood? Where's the most popular section of town? They're not praying about where the need is, but where the money is. And that drives much ministry today, and I think it breaks the heart of God. Jesus didn't care about that at all. He, he, when he saw a need, he met a need, and that's ministry in a nutshell. If you see a need, God has brought it to your attention, not so you can phone call the church and ask what we're going to do about it. God showed you the need so that you might do something about it. You'll give glory to God when you do it. Don't brag on it when you do it. You'll forfeit eternal reward. Just keep it between you and the Lord and the, the people that you're ministering to. The constant emphasis in this letter is on practical Christianity. I really like that. Practical Christianity, which is what? Simply doing what's right, regardless of the direction that society is headed. I mean, if you turn on the news often enough, you'll probably get real depressed. But turn it off then and ask God what he'd have you to do about it. Maybe he wants you praying about the situation. Maybe he wants you sharing the love of Jesus Christ with somebody instead of your political views. Hmm, there's a novel thought in the political season, isn't it? Alcohol, abuse, dishonesty, gluttony, laziness, all of that was going on in the churches scattered throughout the island of Crete, cultural model that is still alive today. Now, what Paul says, in a nutshell, is if you're a Christian, stay away from that crowd. Don't act like them. Don't do that. Do what's right. You're a child of God. Act like it. So he's got some very practical advice here. Uh, the, ta the towns, the churches there on Crete had a reputation, a standard, a, a legacy that had nothing in common with Christianity at all. The world, I don't know if you knew this, I may be busting your bubble now, it's not my intention, but the world has nothing in common with your values, nothing. They have nothing in common with, with your Jesus. They have nothing in common with your faith in God or the hope of the resurrection. At best, you can communicate to them about some very superficial things. How's your job? How's the weather? How about them Broncos? Like God cares? He cares more about the salvation of souls, something we should be concerned about it as well, but because the world, we, we're in the world, but not of the world, we have to draw that line in the sand. You'll remember that Paul would write the Corinthian believers and say, come out from among them, be separate, and I will receive you, says the Lord. That's 2 Corinthians 6.17, paraphrasing two places in the Old Testament. That's the thrust of this letter. The world is out to bury Christians. Stand up for what's right these last days. Don't compromise. Don't try to fit in to get along. You, be a, you are a child of God, then you act like that. Paul describes himself in the opening verse, not as the almighty great apostle Paul. Seems like all of his trials served to humble him. He describes himself, I'm just a servant. A doulos in the original language. A servant, a slave, a household slave, and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, practical Christianity, a faith and a knowledge resting in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. And at his appointed season, he brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God, our Savior. Having identified himself and his calling, he says to Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. 
Always try to maintain the degree of humility that you saw in Christ and in Paul. Be humble. You don't need to brag on yourself. You don't need to tell everybody how smart you are or educated or how long even you've been a Christian. Oh, I've been a Christian for 150 years, you know. You know, that, that has the tone of braggadocio to it. Don't do that. Don't tell people how much money you have or what kind of fancy car you drive if God has blessed you with a fancy car. Be humble. Didn't Jesus say, become like a little child? Didn't he say the greatest in the kingdom of God would be the servant of all? That should be the mindset. And here's how you know if you're a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ or not. When people treat you like a servant instead of royalty. If they treat you like a servant, you should have a grin on your face, not resent it. Well, nobody noticed my service for the Lord. The Lord did. Do all that you do as unto the Lord. Well, I, I did this and they didn't take notice or Pastor Jim didn't mention me by, by name from the pulpit. Tell you what, wear a name tag next week and I will call every single one of you by name from the pulpit. And I will tell you how proud of you I am and how much we love you and your service here. But the bottom line is don't do it for public acclaim or anything Pastor Jim has to say. Do it as unto the Lord. Because he's the one who someday is going to reward you. And you're going to hear something like this when you walk through heaven's gate. Well done, good and faithful servant. Don't do anything for the Lord and then grumble about it. Don't do it. Carries no eternal reward. All you've done is made yourself miserable. If you do something for the Lord, don't brag about it. Just keep it between you and the Lord. That's what Paul is doing. He doesn't say, oh, by the way, I'm the guy who went on three missionary journeys. Thousands of people have gotten saved. I've traveled the whole uh, world in, throughout the Roman Empire in the sharing of the gospel. He's not bragging on himself. He just says, God has called me to be a servant to the elect. Now, that's a loaded term there in verse 1 that sometimes refers to the Jewish people as the elect, the chosen if you will, of God. Sometimes it refers to, depending on context, to saved people. Sometimes it refers to those that are unsaved, but God knows there's someday going to be saved. They're the elect, because God knows the end from the beginning. That term elect can even use, be used to describe the good angels. In 1 Timothy 5.21, Paul describes elect angels. That's Obviously, versus the fallen angels that we call demons today. But my job is the same as Paul's. I've read that and go, well, that's what you, God has asked me to do. In fact, for 2,000 years, this is the job description uh, of pastors to minister to the elect. My job is to, to build up the faith of God's elect. And that's what Paul says. That's my whole goal in this, to build them up in the knowledge of the truth. Verse 2, a, a faith and a knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life. If you're a child of God, if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're going to heaven. It's not a maybe. It's a for sure. You're going to heaven. And it's based on the finished work of Jesus Christ, not your ability to be perfect. We sometimes look in the mirror and we go, man, how could God love me? I'm such a sinner. Well, there is no one that has not sinned. We only vary in kind and degree. So you can either choose to be critical of everybody else's sins and shortcoming, or you can look in the mirror and go, yeah, but God loves me and I'm the same kind of person. Don't be a finger pointer. Don't call names. Don't slander. Don't gossip. Say, God's working on us all. And our hope is in him. And it's in hope of an eternal life, not temporal uh, reward. Our knowledge of Christ, his word, along with the conviction, the empowering of the Holy Spirit, it should change us. It should change us. You should be more loving than you were before you got saved. More knowledgeable is irrelevant. I don't care if you're smarter. You can be smarter and still on your way to hell. But if you say that you know Jesus, I ought to be able to see it in your conduct. I ought to be able to see it in your attitude. And if it's not there, then you take that home and do business with Jesus. Because otherwise you're, bragging, you're bringing fleshly garbage into the church. It'll taint the congregation, it's a cancer. Let God change you. 
And then pray for the people that also need change. And God will always be faithful to send you people that irritate you. <laughs> Have you noticed that? The lesson isn't for them, it's for you. That's why God has allowed them in your life to irritate you. Well, they just push my buttons. Who told you you had the right to have any buttons? Love one another. It's a three-word sermon. I want you to do it. I don't want you to memorize it. I don't want you to talk about it. I just want you to do it. It's simple. My wife the other day bought this curio. It came from, from uh, China. It weighed 110 pounds. I somewhere or another wrestled it in house. Some assembly required. The instruction said it'll only take 80 minutes. Two days later, I'm still trying to figure out why they included instructions in Chinese, French, and Spanish when I, in fact, live in America. But you're supposed to look at the pictures and make sense out of it. Well, it depends on which way you turn the page. I don't, I don't know what language it's in. So my whole family is going through the trial of our lives in the living room trying to put this silly thing together. But many hands make light work. We actually got the job done, and it actually is beautiful. She's got all the little curios in it and stuff, and Michael the archangels at the top there, and the whole thing's filled with family mementos in Christ Jesus over the years. And just looking at it, it's a shrine to God. It's everything that's important to us, and it's summed up in what Jesus has done for us. Saved us not only from our sins, but covered a multitude of sins, given us his own righteousness, given us food, clothing, shelter. We are so blessed. But faith must impact behavior. It must, write that down, please. Your faith must impact your behavior. And that's why Paul is telling this to Titus. Tell those guys, if they're saved, they need to start acting like it. They need to start loving each other. Give up the, the slander, the abuse, the immorality, the drunkenness, the gluttony. They've got it. Faith must impact behavior. Pleasing God is the goal. That's it. If you live a life striving to please God, everything else is going to turn out fine. I don't worry about your flesh then. Because you're not living to please your flesh. You're living to please God. And that's the battle that you faced yesterday, today, and will face again tomorrow. Live a life, just say to, to the Holy Spirit inside of you, Lord Jesus, I just want to please you. I just want to live a life that's pleasing to you. Now we know what's pleasing to him. He said, love one another. If you do that, that's pleasing to him. If you don't love one another, guess what? Whatever you're doing and saying is not pleasing to him. Practical stuff. Paul is reminding these guys of that. Pleasing God is the goal. In, and what, in a nutshell, he's going to say in these three brief chapters is, flesh must give way to the work of the Holy Spirit. The flesh in you, in me, it must give way over time to the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, we know what the fruit of the Holy Spirit is. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, if that doesn't describe you, repent. I'm sorry, Lord, forgive me in Jesus' name. I've not been demonstrating the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and because I'm not, it's been affecting the church. It's been affecting my family. It's been affecting my demeanor. The things of the world are, are too important to me. What you don't want, because the alternative in this life is to walk in constant offense, constantly mad, constantly angry, constantly frustrated. Nobody, nobody wants that. Then let it go. Give it to God. Well, people irritate me. Pray for those people. They need Jesus. Well, they're already saved. Well, they need more of Jesus. So pray harder for them that the Holy Spirit get a hold of them. Because some Christians can be jerks. Not you, mind you. I'm not saying you can be a jerk. But have you noticed that? That sometimes some Christians can be jerks? That's your prayer assignment. That jerk. Don't call them a jerk to their face. They just need Jesus. 
Paul says, I'm, I'm, I want them to know the truth. That's Jesus in his word. It's a truth that leads to godliness. Look at that in verse 1 again. The knowledge, that leads, the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, that means God-likeness. You become more like God and less like your flesh. Certainly le- less like the island of Crete. God-likeness, it's holiness. It means separation from the things of the world and the flesh. What happens is you sin less and things bother you less the closer you are to Jesus Christ. He wants you to live a stress-free life. Don't fight him on it. Don't fight him on it. He died to give you peace. He describes, verse 2, the hope that we have. It's, hope in the Bible is different than hope in the world. Hope in the world sounds something like this. Well, I hope I win the lottery. Well, your chances of getting struck by lightning are better statistically. When the Christian says hope, it's a firm and unshakable confidence in an outcome that's promised in Scripture. It's based on the promises of God and His ability to perform, not mine. My hope is thus eternal. It's anchored in God's ability to perform it. Verse 3 describes him as God, our Savior. Reminds me that God's not willing that any should perish. There is plenty of wickedness in the world we live in today. Can I tell you their greatest need is Jesus. To be born again by the power of God's Holy Spirit. God wants everyone to come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us, you know the passage well that Jesus quoted, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That should be our heart and mind. There's plenty wrong in the world today. There is inside of us something that demands a holy and just justice to all of the crimes, the violence, the drugs. The list goes on and on out there. And there's something in us that cries out. What they need is Jesus. What they need is Jesus. We can hold them accountable and give them Jesus simultaneously. He describes Titus in verse 4 there, my true son in our common faith. Now, he said the same thing about Timothy. Do you have a Timothy or a Titus in your life? Somebody that you're speaking into, somebody that you're stretching spiritually, somebody that you're discipling one way, shape, or form, or another. It might be a son or a daughter in your own family or a grandson or a granddaughter. It might be somebody in the workplace that just needs a, a little bit of encouragement once in a while. That's why God has you in their life. Grace and peace, he gives to him the Greek and the Hebrew shalom greeting, the most common greetings there were. The church was made up of Jews and Gentiles, and Paul was sensitive to both of them. And then he goes on in verse 5, he says, Now here's what I did. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out, interesting term, straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders, say elders, As I directed you, an elder must be blameless, the husband of but one wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient, since an overseer, wait a minute, he just flipped terms. He called him an elder before, and now he calls him an overseer. One describes the person, the other term describes his job. His job description. We'll talk more about that in just a second. But since an overseer, verse 7, is entrusted with God's work, he must be blameless. Not perfect, but without serious charge against him. Not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, one who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine. Where do you get that from? The Word of God. And refute those who oppose it. Because Paul had such confidence in Titus, 
He uses a medical term to describe the man's ministry. The re, verse 5, the reason I left you in Crete was so that you might straighten out what was left unfinished. That's a medical term that describes the setting of a displaced fracture. It's the setting of a bone. In other words, there are some really broken people in, in the island of Crete at the different churches, and I want you to, those things that are crooked, I need you to set straight amongst these congregations. If they're going to heal and mend properly to restore best function, I, I need you to set them straight with the Word of God. And he says, appoint, that is designate, appoint, ordain. Elders, that's where we get our word Presbyterian, presbyteros, means literally old guy. The word has a Hebrew background going all the way back to the 70 elders Moses appointed to help him in his work. And then, as I said, elders and overseer are used interchangeably here. And again in verse 5 and verse 7, and have the same requirements. First of all, at the risk of offending you, and I, it is not my intention, but if we have any feminists in the house, I have to tell you, if we're going to be faithful to the word of God, all of these are masculine nouns. They're not listed in the neuter. They're never listed in the feminine. You've got to come to grips with that. I know we live in a day and age that has different cultural expectations, but the Word of God has stood the test of time over 2,000 years. Men are to be in leadership of the church. doesn't mean that women can't pray, can't prophesy, speak in tongues, help out in a thousand different areas in the church, but they're forbidden by the Word of God to be pastors, elders, and overseers. If that offends you, I apologize. But I didn't write the book. I am called by God to follow the book. And that's what it says. Now, in light of culture, you can say, well, I don't care what the Bible says. I like women pastors. Well, that's great. Then don't call yourself a Christian. If you're not bound by the word of God, why do you even bother to go to church and read the Bible? If you're not going to do what it says, how can I call myself a pastor and say, thus saith the Lord, and then tell you something that it doesn't say? Well, I'm good with women pastors. I'm not because God's not. Jesus wasn't. Titus wasn't. Paul's not. Timothy's not. But in, there's such cultural pressure put upon us today. But these are, these are all masculine nouns. Men have largely abdicated leadership in the church which is why in a great many churches they have women pastors, women deacons, women elders, and everybody back there in Sunday school is a woman because women see a need and meet a need. That's just the nature uh, of the gals that God made. They're sensitive to that, and I understand that. However, we are not free to set God's word aside. What we should do is pray that God would raise up some teaching elders like myself. There are also non-teaching elders that Paul has described in 1 Timothy 5.17. But the Bible says, because pastoring is, is difficult sometimes, 1 Thessalonians 5.12 says, respect those guys that are over you in the Lord. Elder indicates the qualifications that were necessary. Elder, the old guys literally, should be the guys with wisdom, maturity, experience. An elder is who he is. An overseer is what he does. I have general oversight of, of the whole church. That doesn't mean I teach every Sunday school class. doesn't mean that I lead the women's group. Those poor ladies, Thursday I went back there and, 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 and talked with the ladies back there for a while. And i got to tell you, there's just something that feels a little intimidating in a room full of women, and you're the only guy in the room. You know, I don't want to offend anybody. I certainly don't want to eat all their donuts and goodies, although women are always smart enough to bring those. I just love that about our ladies' groups. But there I am talking to this bunch of ladies. I can only identify so much because I, I don't know about you, but I've never been a woman. I can identify with them. I can love on them. I can try my best to meet them where they're at. But I, what I can't say is, I know exactly how you feel. But as an overseer in the church, sometimes, you know what? 
I'll be talking to the junior hires or the Sunday school classes or any one of a lot of other things. I'll be doing the hospital visitations or the counseling or a thousand other things. I don't mind doing that at all, but I understand the mantle of responsibility that comes with male leadership within the church. No man is an island. We need deacons, we need elders, we need women, we need children, we need everybody in this thing called the body of Christ. Every one of you has an important and critical role to fill in the body of Christ. It is only that the office of pastor, overseer or elder, if you will, falls to a man. Paul would write the Corinthians later on and says, ladies, do you think the gospel began with you? Who was created first? Adam. And Adam was made in the image of God, who was, whose image was Eve made in. Well, she was made from Adam's rib. So God has, by virtue of that, handed down ever since then spiritual headship. It doesn't give any man the right to be a, a dictator. It doesn't give any man the right to be a chauvinist. Oh, can I just say this? Have you ever heard the term chauvinist? You ever looked up in a dictionary what it means? It is one of the most abusive terms you could ever call a human being. You need to know what you're talking about before you start throwing out words that are common to the world's vocabulary, must never be in yours. Don't call anybody a chauvinist. I'm surprised at how many people use that term. I've been called that and asked ladies, do you have any idea what that means? Because if you did, I should slap your face. Not slapped anybody's lady's face yet, but I'll tell you what, don't, let's not be quick to throw about disparaging terms, please. Not, it only tears down the body of Christ. It doesn't build up. Overseer, elder, indicates wisdom, maturity, and experience. That's who he is. The overseer in verse 7 indicates the responsibility that God has given him, watching over God's flock, exercising oversight of the church in general. I'm no dictator. We've got a church board. We pray about every major decision that we have to make here. There's tons of give and take. But overseer describes the work that I'm called to. I have oversight of it. And God will hold me accountable for that. He will not hold you accountable for that. I don't mind bearing that, that mantle at all because that's what God has called me to. I love being a pastor. I love being a shepherd. But I, that makes me your servant, not your dictator, not your boss, not your anything except your brother in Christ. And then he outlines, starting in verse 6 there, these qualifications. Sounds just like it did when he wrote Timothy. In fact, they're nearly identical, which tells me this applies to all churches in all times, in all places whether it's on the island of Crete, Ephesus. In other words, every rule for every church on planet Earth, this applies to. It's not a cultural thing. Well, they just needed masculine leadership there because things were out of control. No, this is his standard for all churches in all times at all places. And no, that's not popular in some circles today. I know there are ordained women pastors. I'm just telling you what the Word of God says not making excuses for other churches or denominations that violate God's word. Your choice. Will you follow it or not? Will you resent it or not? You can only resent it if you look at the word of God through the lens of, of corrupt culture. And then we start, well, what's wrong with women? Nothing is wrong with women. You're misunderstanding what God says. Spiritual headship has been given husbands in the family. That's why wives are supposed to submit to their husband's spiritual headship. It says that's many different times in the New Testament. So to be the spiritual leader of my home falls on me, not my wife. Paul will relay these same exact pastoral qualifications several different times. The same standards apply to all churches at all times. But we live in a day and age where people say, I believe this is the Word of God, but then I practice whatever I want to. Pastors do that. Deacons do that. Elders do that. Women do that. Men do that. Churches do that. We have to be careful of that. So that's what Paul is saying. Can we get back to the basics? 
Regardless of how you feel about culturally sensitive issues, what does the Word of God say? That will inform how you should feel about abortion, drinking, drugs, and a wide variety of culturally relevant topics today. What does the Word of God say? Apart from what you think or feel. The Bible never says, do this if you feel like it. Any more than my wife said, we'll put together the curio in our living room if you feel like it. It would still be sitting there in that 110-pound box. But since I have learned to uh, speak Chinese now and can interpret pictures, and with the help of everybody in my family, the job got done. To a picture of the body of Christ, we need each other. I don't resent the structure that God has placed within the church. I praise his holy name for it. Here's what's going to happen today. Some of you are going to walk out of here, and because you're already offended at what I've said, that offense is just going to grow and grow and grow as you go back out into the world. Because I didn't tell you something that your flesh wanted to hear. I didn't tell you something that was culturally relevant. You have to understand what Paul is telling Titus to do flies in the face of everything that was practiced in Cretan society in that day and age. Oh, you're going to speak against drunkenness? You're going to speak against gluttony? Well, that's just not popular preaching, Paul. We're not here to tickle ears, but to change society. We're world changers. That's what we've been called to do. Godly character will shape the way our society sees us if, in fact, the church becomes more like God. Verse 6, an elder must be blameless. Mentioned twice in just two verses here. It does not mean sinless perfection. It means he is to be of good character. He's to be without accusation. He doesn't have a bench warrant out for him. He's not on a milk carton in a post office somewhere you know, wanted, dead or alive. You know, it just means that there's no outstanding or unresolved issues that need to be brought to his attention. Not perfect, but trying hard to be. That's all that term means. Because if a pastor was required to be perfect before he'd be a pastor, we would never have pastors on planet Earth. There are no perfect ones. But notice it says, as part of his qualifications there in verse 6, he must be the husband of but one wife. That is difficult if you've got a woman pastor. How can she be the husband of but one wife? It's impossible. He's describing a male office. Don't be offended by that. Must be the husband of but one wife. Literally, a one Woman, man. Now, polygamy was forbidden by Roman law, so he's not talking about multiple wives. Divorce was rampant throughout the Roman Empire, but Paul did not specifically say in this passage or Timothy that divorced men were excluded from the ministry. In fact, Paul had used the word divorced before. That's not what he says here. It's also not a command, you got to be married before you can be a pastor. No. You have to be faithful. Since elders were older men of the congregation, Paul assumes that most of them were married. But unmarried men were not disqualified. Paul himself was unmarried. What he means most likely is that a pastoral candidate should be faithful. If married, he should be monogamous. A monogamous married life was to be maintained. He was to be a one-woman kind of man. If unmarried, he's not to be a womanizer. So the issue is not whether he's married or not, but his character. He needs to be a, a person of solid character. Not given to drunkenness, it says in verse 7. Alcohol abuse is epidemic in our world today. I would like to say I've never heard of a pastor that was in bondage to alcohol, but I have. Closet alcoholics and things like that. If you have a problem with, with drinking as a Christian, just you, you don't need to drink at all. Just don't bother. Don't go there. 
Just don't go there. Don't, don't be tempted. Because some people, when they drink too much, become violent. And if you haven't noticed, alcohol tends to lower your moral standards. You would do things under the influence of alcohol that you would never do sober. The Bible says, be not filled with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. As alcohol controls you and your conduct, so the Holy Spirit wants to do that in the life of a believer. So avoid alcohol. I mean, it's not a requirement. Oh, you can't be saved and, and have a beer once in a while. Don't, just don't let it dominate you. Don't let it taint your witness. I've been to far too many events where I have seen Christians drink far too much alcohol. Let me just say two words about that. Stop it. Okay, you want to have some friends over and have some alcohol? Be careful or something really stupid is going to happen because it lowers your stupid threshold if you haven't noticed. Not given to drunkenness, not violent. Sometimes alcohol makes people violent. It did my dad. Scared me away from alcohol growing up as a kid. Yet a rite of passage at our house was when you're five years old, you had to drink a can of beer with dad. That's the kind of society that we're growing up in today. My dad was a violent drunk, and I, I don't want anything to do with that. If you have a problem with alcohol, you best stay away from it. There's not a prohibition against alcohol in the Old or New Testament, but there is plenty of prohibition against its abuse. Don't abuse it. Be careful. Be careful. Be wise to it. And by the way, you don't want to stumble other people. Maybe you go to a restaurant and you feel the freedom to have a drink, but maybe somebody comes over and says, well, pastor, I thought you were a teetotaler. Looks like you're getting drunk. You got like five or six glasses in front of you there, pastor. Uh, okay. That's not the kind of uh, example you want to be setting. So don't do that. Don't do that. Not given to drunkenness. Do what's right. Again, the practical application of our faith. We don't do these things to get saved. We do these things because we are saved. It's totally different. Because Jesus Christ sits on the throne of my heart, my conduct is changed. It's not forced. My conduct has changed because I want to live a life that's, that's pleasing to him. And that's it. Verse 8 describes the overseer. He has to be somebody who's hospitable, who loves what is good, who is self-controlled sexually and with the use of alcohol. He is upright, holy, and disciplined. Why? Because he is a disciple. Disciple and disciplined come from exactly the same root word. If you are a disciple of Christ, then you should live a disciplined life as your testimony to the world and to the church. Verse 9, he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, the Word of God, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine. He gets that from the Word of God. This is what I do because of, of who I am, because my true identity really comes out of my actions, doesn't it? Verse 10, for there are many rebellious people out there, mere talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group. These are legalistic Judaizers. They said, well, you being a Christian is fine, but you also have to celebrate. You have to go to church on Saturday. You've got to be a Sabbath keeper. You've got to keep the Jewish law. You've got to keep the Jewish dietary laws. Now we're going back to legalism. The law couldn't save it, could only condemn. You can't even name the Ten Commandments, let alone keep them. And even if you could, there were 613 Jewish rules and regulations you had to keep. And you've broken a lot of them, and you didn't even know you did. But like any cop will tell you, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Give you a for instance. By a show of hands, how many of you have ever in your life had catfish, shrimp, crab, lobster, squid, snake, 
rodents. I, I don't know what your dietary habits are like. By the raising of your hand, you just condemned yourself to hell. That's, that was the Jewish law. You can't eat that stuff. That's what separated the Jewish dietary laws from. Thank God we're no longer under the law. But there is still something that's afoot in, in the churches today that said, well, being saved by grace is fine, but you should also do this. You should also, oh, trusting in Christ for your salvation is fine, but you need to be baptized. Oh, trusting in Christ is fine, but you also need church membership. Well, trusting in Christ is fine, but you've got to go to church on Saturday or you're going to hell. Oh, trusting in Christ is fine, but like these Judaizers saying, you've got to keep the Jewish law too. No, you don't. I want to live to please Christ. I am free. Those who the Son sets free are free indeed, not free to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. I'm free to serve. I'm free to love him. I'm free to just be the man that God has called me to be without constraints. Beware of legalists today. People that think they're holier than you because they don't do something that you do or vice versa. People that insist that Christians should keep all of the Jewish laws, especially in regard to circumcision. I can just imagine the Greeks of the first century going, circumcision, I'm 35, and you're telling me so I got to, in order to be saved, I got to keep the Jewish ritual of circumcision? Oh, thanks. These guys were profiteers. They were legalists for hire as religious teachers. And I'm saddened by the fact that profit seems to drive many ministries today. If it costs you money to grow in Christ, run the other way as fast as you can. It's not about money. Discipleship shouldn't be at personal expense or cost other than time an investment of one's life. But if all you hear out of a ministry is money, 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 and you see them flying in jet planes and living in, in kajillion dollar houses, you want to just run away from that ministry. They're there to clean your clock and take your money, and that is all that they are in, in business of doing. Verse 10, there are many rebellious people, mere talkers, deceivers of these uh, circumcision, these Judaizers, verse 11, they must be silenced because they're ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. M money should not be the thrust of any church. I'll always be honest enough with you to tell you exactly where the church's finances are at. We try to be real good stewards. We try our level bet. We've never been late on, on payments. We make our mortgages. We've got to do all the same things you do, but we don't hoard money, and nobody on staff here is getting rich. Verse 12, even one of their own prophets, the Cretan prophets, had said this about Cretans. Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. <laughs> He's quoting there as a 6th century Cretan poet called Ep Epimenides, who was a native of Knossos, Greek. In, in Greek literature, I mean, the town, the island was proverbial. To Cretanize meant to lie. That was their legacy. Can I ask you what kind of legacy you're leaving as a Christian? What kind of legacy are, are you leaving? I guess with the passing away of my friend Jesse, it just brings you back to what kind of a legacy are you leaving? What kind of legacy? And it shouldn't have anything to do with a name of a church or a building or anything else like that. Well, I just want to leave a, a good legacy. Just leave the word legacy entirely. Live a life that's pleasing to God and your legacy will take care of itself. Because legacy says it has something to do with you. No, it doesn't. It has everything to do with Christ. Get your hands off of that. All the glory belongs to him. He is the one who saved us. Legacy. I, I've grown to disdain the term because it seems so self-centered. If I leave a legacy, it's, I just want my tombstone to say something like it. He loved Jesus. He loved Jesus. Imperfect, but he sure tried hard. He loved Jesus, and he told the, the people what the Word of God said even when it wasn't popular. 
Even when people got up and walked out, we stuck with the Word of God. I, that's the kind of, if I'm going to leave a legacy, that's what I'd like it to be. Verse 13, this testimony is true, what the poet said. Therefore, rebuke these legalists sharply so that they will be sound in faith and pay no attention to Jewish myths or the commands of those who reject the truth. I hear that all the time from Messianic believers today. Oh, you Gentiles, that's great. You're saved, but you really should keep all of the Jewish festivals. You really should. I, we get calls every Easter. Well, you, are you guys having a Passover cedar? No. Why? Because there's not one recorded in the New Testament as practiced by the, the church. No, we don't do that. That type was fulfilled in Christ Jesus. He is our Passover lamb. Verse 15, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupt and do not believe, nothing is pure. They'll find fault with everything. It, you, there are some people that will judge you by your diet. Do you know how often I get asked, when's the last hot dog I ate? <laughs> oh, you're so much more holy because you don't eat hot dogs, right? Well, let me confess my sins. I actually went to Schnitzel the other day, and me and Luke, we got five for five. Five chili cheese dogs, and we sat down and we ate every one of them, loved it, regretted it all the next day. But I find that I'm no more holy if I do or less holy if I don't. So get off the diet thing. You are not a more holy Christian if you're a vegetarian. Or I only eat organic. Sounds snobbish. Keep it to yourself. That's fine. Eat whatever God puts in front of you. That, that's fine. But don't think that it has anything to do with spiritual superiority. It doesn't. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and their consciences are corrupted. They think these Judaizers do, that they're more holy. They claim to know God, but by their actions deny him. Notice that personal conduct demonstrates the reality of your faith. Your personal conduct when you're not sitting in church on Sunday morning, your personal conduct demonstrates the reality of your faith. You've heard it said before, actions speak louder than words. That's true. The truest test of one's faith is seen in their actions. You say you believe in Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. Does your life reflect that? That's what he's calling the, these people on the island of Crete to examine. Examine yourselves. Many people today profess to know God, but their lives deny Him. I think Christianity, above all else, must be practical. It has to be practical. Practice these things. It has to be something that changes your life. How do you put your faith into practice as a Christian? No pun intended. Practice. Practice, practice, practice. Practice makes perfect. Well, at least we'll make you more holy than if you don't practice it. So practice. Read your Bible. Pray. Worship. Fellowship. Practice communion. See Acts 2.42 and verses following where they devoted themselves to prayer and the apostles' teaching, to communion, the fellowship of the saints. So that's how to succeed as a Christian. Practice. You want to know the Word of God better? Read the Word of God more. Practical Christianity. Can I just tie a bow around this whole uh, first of the chapter and let you out of here. Number one, be like Paul. Be a servant. Adopt a servant's mentality. Be humble. Be kind. Don't be overbearing. Don't be everyone else's critic. Be a servant. You're here to serve the body of Christ and to serve the Lord God Almighty. Secondly, practice your faith because it's best seen in action, not words. Your personal conduct says more about the reality of your Christian faith than anything that comes out of your mouth. Can I tell you something? You may not be aware of people are watching. People are judging Christianity by your actions. They look at you and say, I either want to be just like them because they're just like Jesus, or I don't want to be nothing like them because they're nothing like Jesus. 
You're setting an example for the whole world to see. Set a good example is what Paul is saying. Because what you do is far more important than anything that comes out of your mind. Words are cheap. Words are cheap. In fact, the whole uh, book of James says, you show me your faith. Don't talk about your faith. Show me your faith. Thirdly, in verses 6 and 7, strive to live a life that is as blameless as possible. I know you're not perfect. You think you're perfect, but there is nobody else in your family or room that thinks you are. But you should make it your ambition to be as Christ-pleasing as you can be. I just want to please him. I just want to live for him. I want to be blameless in as much as possible. Now, we all sin and fall short the glory of God, but I'm not going to stop pursuing perfection. I won't manage, master it until I cross heaven's threshold, but I'll die trying. Lastly, but not leastly, and you're thinking, well, this has to do with pastors, so excuse me if I slept through your whole sermon. All of us... All of us are elders or overseers of somebody. If you are older than anybody you know, you're already an elder. Set a good example because people are watching. You say, well, I'm not an overseer. Oh, really? Do you have any kids? Do you have any grandkids? Do you have any co-workers? Do you, any young people that God has put around you that just need a mentor, a helping hand? All of us are elders and overseers to, to someone, so be sure you set a good example and do it by the power of God's Holy Spirit. Please don't get religious on me. Don't start quoting things in different languages, trying to sound spiritual. or Like my mom always told me, Jimmy, if you get your education, don't talk like it. Stay humble. Stay humble. It's all about Jesus. But he has to be able to do a work in you before he can do a work through you. Understand the priority. You got to be fixed first before you can fix anybody else. Okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm amazed sometimes by the reasons people pursue the different degrees they do. Doctors will often go into the medical field because everybody in their family had medical issues. You should do that because God's called you to do that. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a psychiatrist because everybody in my family screwed up. <laughs> That's not a good reason to become a psychiatrist. Well, I'm going to be a counselor because nobody ever counseled me. This is not retribution. Quite frankly, if you don't have the love of Jesus on your heart, you've got nothing to give anybody else. It starts with you and Jesus. So do me a favor this week. Work on you and Jesus. Don't be working on nobody else. You hear what I'm saying? Nod your heads like this. Yeah, I hear you, Pastor Jim. Don't you be working on nobody else. You work on you and let God work on them. And unless you are the Holy Spirit, knock it off. <laughs>